I had this amazing friend and she offered me a little bit of coaching time in the spirit of getting trained towards coaching. And in the midst of that, she offered me some contemplative practice. So I had grown up Seventh-day Adventist. I had spent a lot of my young adult life in a Pentecostal charismatic environment. So everything is loud and emotive and full of body, but there wasn't a lot of quiet in life. And so um, I think the first exercise I was given was to utilize the scripture, be still and know that I am God. And you just journaled everything on B that would come out and everything on still that would come out. And this is remarkable. Yes. Yes. I don't know how to mute people. Yeah, she's yeah. <laughs> Um, and then I started, she offered me a little bit more. She offered me some breath prayer. Now, ironically, I'm going to offer you breath prayer today, but I will tell you, it wasn't my favorite thing to do at first because I had been an opera singer. And so thinking about my breath meant that I thought about what does my expansion look like? What does my alignment look like? It was all connected to my profession and there wasn't a lot of spiritual in there. So actually the thing that I'm going to offer today uh, I got just a few years ago, and it helped me really understand breath. And the reason we're going to do it today, even though it wasn't my favorite, is because our breath is with us everywhere we go. So there's lots of other really fun stuff that we can do with paper and colors and movement and music and so many wonderful things. But our breath is always there, and we always have it to ground us and center us. So that's why we'll start there. So I experimented with other types of prayers and meditations as time went on as well. And now on you know, every Monday I offer a 10 minute and we go through and I, I teach all kinds of things. So things that have been offered to me and things that I read about. So that's a little bit about why I got started. Essentially because my life was eating me and I needed a way to slow down and find center and find presence in the midst of it all. So that's a little bit about how I got there. And that was that probably started about a decade ago. So does anybody else need a piece of paper? I want to offer up the opportunity for, as others are saying things, if you want to jot things Would down. Would you like a lecture? I'd check how it looks on the camera because I'm an opera singer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so first let's take this word contemplative. And I would love to hear when you hear the word, oh, and if you're at home, if you want a piece of paper to jot things down, feel free. Otherwise, um, if you would like the handout. I'm a, I'm a set designer. <laughs> Together, we make magic. <laughs> if, um, if you would like the handout for today, you can email me. It's Christina with a K, K-R-I-S-T-I-N-A, M as in Michelle, Kaiser, K-A-I-S-E-R, at Gmail. But let's take this word contemplative to start. When you hear the word contemplative, what do you think? To contemplate. To contemplate. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, there are no wrong answers. <laughs> Awareness. Awareness. Being still and thinking. Being still and thinking. Quiet individual activity. Activity. Attention. Attention. I think of you. <laughs> Christina, mom. <laughs> and does anybody hazard a guess if someone was to define the word contemplative? Be 
these are all great, by the way. We have self-awareness, stillness, thought. Well, you've got con, which is with or a communal effort, and then and then perhaps something along the roots of temple. Temple. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. This is great. Yeah, this contemplative, a lot of people have tried really hard. So, Dan, um, I don't know how much like Greek will be in here, <laughs> but you can bring it. <laughs> um, so the best definition that I have heard, I think came from Richard Rohr, and I thought it was so simple and so helpful. He said, contemplative was simply opening to the awareness of the presence of the divine, of God. To become contemplative, to become aware. And so we had some of this, right? We use these words, awareness. And we're going to use some other words that are going to bring in some of the words you were saying. This activity, attention, right? Attention and awareness are very close together. How do I open to the awareness of the presence of God? And what about the word spiritual? When you hear that word spiritual, what comes to mind? Led by Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Led by Holy Spirit. Yeah, I was going to say uh, having a spirit within. Spirit within. Similar to <laughs> I was thinking one with the spirit. One with. Good. Anything else on spiritual? Can I request that when people are answering, speak up, please? Some of us have hearing problems. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we have Holy Spirit, Spirit within. One with and breath. Am I allowed to be a little irreverent? <laughs> There's um like spiritual is kind of a pop culture term and oh, it can yes. kind of be you uh, can be used as a excuse to not like kind of have a container for your um, for your worship. You, uh -huh. know, you can just sample and dip your toes in where it feels good, but not really have to dive in. So. Um, on, in a superficial way, that's sometimes how it's thrown around today. Sure. I wonder how to put that in one word. Yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Irreverent. <laughs> Good. So there's, there's multiple things that we think of when we think of spiritual. Uh, for one thing, affecting our human soul or spirit but also connecting with this idea or belief that there's something greater than us, that we are part of something larger. Searching for meaning and purpose. So, right, we can, that can look like a whole lot of things. We're coming to this moment to say, I'm opening to the awareness of the presence of God because I understand this notion that there's something more, there's something bigger, and I want to be a part of it, or I'm looking for some sort of revelation. And so people call this different things. Sometimes people say um, receiving and extending love, right? I am both taking love in and I am sending love out. So if we think about contemplative spirituality, if we put that word contemplative together and spirituality, it turns out really any experience of connecting with the divine is contemplative spirituality. So back when I was in the Pentecostal experience and we are hooting and hollering, it turns out that is a communal contemplative experience as I open to the presence of God. If I am similarly quiet and paying attention to my breathing, I also have this opportunity to open to the presence of the divine. So really, anything, right? This phrase, it all belongs, this too belongs, is a really big deal. Because sometimes we think 
contemplative spirituality is only breathing and is only silence, which becomes a really big deal if you are afraid of silence, you don't know how to be silent, you're really self-critical because every time you get silent, your mind is going, this all belongs, right? Sometimes I have to, this is also a big deal because when I first started with contemplative spirituality, spirituality, I was so disappointed that I could not cure anxiety, that somehow breathing didn't stop me from feeling really nervous. And there was plenty to be nervous about because we were traveling and it's COVID and oh my God, I'm gonna take all these kids somewhere. So I got really, really nervous. <clears throat> And I thought, what is this that I can't just calm it? And then I learned that a hug <laughs> sometimes does something that my breathing doesn't do. And that this too belongs. And so really, contemplative spirituality can help me also name my emotion, sit in the difficulty of my emotion, include God in the middle of my emotion, as opposed to, I need to get rid of it. I need to get rid of my emotion. I can only have positive ones. Now I can have a larger container, as it turns out. So contemplative practice, if we have this spirituality and experience of connecting, our practice is that experience of stopping and becoming aware, right? Whatever we choose, however we choose to do that. So different contemplative questions that get asked, and we'll probably pay attention to these when we do our breathing exercise. You'll hear uh, spiritual directors say this all the time, but what is stirring in you? What's shimmering, if you prefer sparkle? <laughs> what are you inspired towards? So this inner wisdom, sometimes we call it spirit, but if we're not sure what we think about spirit in a larger context, sometimes we just speak of inner wisdom. But what's going on? What's coming up? What do I feel? What do I see? What do I hear? And so in terms of why this is helpful for us, there's a scripture, Romans 12, 2. And maybe at this point, I'm going to pass around the sheet so that everybody can have it. Maybe I'll send sheets going two ways. Or three ways. I think it's three ways. So Romans twelve two. It says, "Do not be." Conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So this notion of transforming and renewing the mind is a huge deal when it comes to the contemplative. It's like a key place that we can glom onto. What are we trying to do? So when I talk about contemplative spirituality, I often talk to people about monkey mind, the treadmill of the mind, just busyness. And so usually what happens is people say, I got still. In fact, when I was first introducing this to our church in, in Boston, they sent me a Instagram or TikTok of an actor who was sitting on a counter trying to get still. And he really just like, showed all the things that would go through his mind, like this distraction and that distraction. It ends with, I'm coming, mom. So I don't know why mom <laughs> was in the back. But um, they said, this is how we feel when we do this. We feel so keyed up and like this is so difficult and we don't know if we want to do it. But then we would do stuff together and they would say, oh my gosh, I feel like I heard from God. That was crazy. So we, we tend to have this problem, right, where we have a really good experience, and then we're not sure if it will happen again, and so then we don't dive back into the water. We just kind of try to stay where it feels safe, sort of like we were talking about earlier today. But each and every time, if I hand somebody blank papers and colors, because I love color, people will say to me, I don't know what I'm going to put on this page. 
And then something emerges, and they say, I can't believe this. And then it seems to have meaning. And so the more that we do that, the more we feel encouraged, we feel confident that we can try this again and see what comes up. But really, this monkey mind is part of the thing that we're trying to still, if you will. So Isaac of Syria, who many of us may or may not know because he was part of the Eastern Orthodox Church, became a saint in the 7th century. He says, until the mind is freed from the multitudes of thoughts and has achieved the single simplicity of purity, it cannot experience spiritual knowledge, that connection to those things that are bigger than ourselves. So he says, until we free this mind. And so sometimes uh, people talk about the mind-heart connection now. It can be dropped down. Sometimes people talk about my body, I feel. I'm a heart personality, so if you do a meditation that starts here and you go down, once we get to the heart, I will feel very open. But a lot of times, because of all the energy in my body, like a director would probably encourage me to find even a lower center, maybe even connect into the ground, feel rooted. So sometimes I pretend I'm a tree, you know, just let those roots grow. So we spend a lot of time in our heads. The head is useful. We learn lots of great things. The same as words are amazing. I love words. But it's also nice to be free of words once in a while. Let that treadmill go. Connect to the whole self. So, that being said, I want to offer us a sacred breath practice. To aid me, I'm going to use an app called Insight Timer. So this is a free app in case you're interested. They do have guided meditations on the app, but you can also <laughs> set your own, how many minutes you would like it to go. They have different chimes. They have different sounds. So when people sit in a practice, everybody's different. Sometimes there's a desire to just focus on the breath, but sometimes if you're like me, maybe you got a little tripped up on your breath. So it can be helpful to have something else. So I usually play a sound. Uh, it's going to be like a stream and some chirping birds because mm, nature. And that sometimes helps me focus on something else. So if you're in the midst of this and the sound of my voice is not what you want to listen to, feel free to go to the, the babbling brook and the stream. It's called the secret garden if you end up downloading the app. Uh, at home, I have a singing bowl. I didn't bring it today, but they're wildly good fun. You can hit it and go around and allow that to be a centering practice. Other times, people use a flame as something to focus on, or even an aroma, if that would be interesting. I don't often like pull together an aroma, but you can. So there is no right or way wrong, wrong or right way to sit. You could also lay down, <laughs> but it might be hard. But I will tell you, when I first came to this church after like 20 years of being up on the platform every Sunday, I could have just as well laid down in a pew as sat up straight. I only sat up for your benefit, honestly. <laughs> Because it was nice just to receive for a minute, just to take it in. So there are people who say, I, I prefer to have my feet flat on the ground. That's kind of symbolic for a lot of people because we're talking about that groundedness, that centeredness, that rooting. But if I'm on my couch and I feel like having my legs crossed, I don't worry about the rules. So whatever feels comfortable to you. A lot of people like to close their eyes because it takes some of the external sensory world away. If that would feel scary or not great, sometimes people just focus a little bit beyond them. So you're welcome to do whichever makes sense for you. So I want to invite you from wherever you are to take in a breath. And exhale slowly, letting go of the weight and the thoughts, allowing yourself to arrive here in this present moment. 
taking in yet another cleansing breath and allowing a sacred awe to run through your body as you relax. Sacred Breath Practice, adapted from a meditation originally led by Janice Lynn Lundy. For those of us on a dedicated spiritual path, we may find comfort in relating to the breath as something that is sacred. The word breath comes from the Greek word spiritus, which translates as spirit. This invites us to view the breath in an entirely new light as a spiritual gift. And most religious spiritual traditions support this. Many traditions hold creation stories about a divine being who breathes life into Earth's creatures, including humanity. In the Hebrew tradition, the word for breath is ruach, spelled R-U-A-C-H. In general, this word means wind, breath, mind, or spirit. The Ruach is the breath that is given by the Creator God. It's a creative act infusing each being, including animals, with a life force. And this life force is considered sacred. If we think about it, the spiritual interpretation of breath may make quite a bit of sense because without life-giving breath, the body as we know it dies. We, as we experience ourselves in physical form, we would cease to exist without breath. And so in this context, Thinking of breathing as a sacred act, it can be very calming. It invites a sense of the divine presence of connection. We are not alone. We feel engaged with a higher power that has care and concern for us. It's possible then that connecting with our breath as sacred, that it has the potential to transform our conversations and our interactions. Our conversations move from simple talking to a deeper way of being with others that feels sacred. This means that before we go into a meeting or a conversation, before a conversation even begins, we can begin to connect with our breath as though it is sacred. We can realize it's the gift of breath that allows us to be present, to be here with these other people. This sacred breath can naturally become a calming source it can remind us we are not alone. With time and practice, we become increasingly more able to do this wherever we are. And even when we're engaged in casual conversation, it can help us feel calmer, more centered. And so I invite you to take a few moments, relaxing the posture, leaning back into a posture of receptivity. 
taking a few gentle breaths. Notice the breath moving through your body and into a deeper place. You may begin thinking about how air enters your nostrils, how it moves down through the body all the way through and back out again. Notice this breath in the deepest part of your body, not only your chest. Because when we focus in a shallow space, this can cause rapid breathing, anxiety. But instead, we want to take the breath as deep into the body as we can. you do this, imagine that this great breath, breath of the world, source of life, Ruach, breathing itself through you, entering your nostrils or your mouth, moving through your body in the most loving way calming you, nourishing you, like a gentle breeze from head to toe, filling you with life. Take some time to relax into this and savor the experience. What we sometimes discover is that we are both breathing and being breathed, which affirms the fact that the divine is gifting us with life, because without this breath, we are not here. And so we rest into this process of being breathed. We enjoy it. We rest into the awareness that we are purposefully created. We relax and let the thoughts go because we know that we are fully supported with every breath that we take. Just a couple more relaxed 
Inhales and exhales. And then in your own time, maybe just wiggle a few parts of the body. Slowly return to eyes open if your eyes have been closed. And welcome back. So as we sit in that experience, It can be helpful sometimes to have a space to process. Did I have questions? Was I doing it right? <laughs> Did I notice anything? Was I surprised? Did I not like anything? I would love to hear from you. What did you notice? What questions did you have? I found it really very relaxing. <laughs> Ah, yes. It's almost. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if Dominic was in here, he would have been snoring already. <laughs> I've led numerous meditations, 60 seconds in. <laughs> His stress level is very low. <laughs> Lowered stress level, yes. By uh, focusing on your voice, then I. You know, I'd wander off a little bit, but like, no, let's go back. And so that kept my thoughts, all those other thoughts away. I was just sort of focusing on that and relaxing. Yeah, that fits, that fits me too. I, I did some Buddhist training years ago where the... the Can my, you speak louder? Yeah, my teacher said exactly, exactly what Christina has been teaching us about. It all belonged. It's all part of it. So there'd be that kind of rapid shifts in attention, and she would say, your breath is your home. Come back home, come back home. So I stopped trying to you know, control it, except to just be reminded there's a home space and it's in your breathing. So, okay. Very good, thank you. Yeah. I was going to say it's very Tai Chi ish. <laughs> yes. In the sense, just the breathing. You know, like, yes. Yeah. 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 Oh. For, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm a singer and I'm, I'm used to, you know, breath, the breath control and things like that. But what's interesting is overlaying the breath and creating an alignment that creates space for the breath. Mm -hmm. And whether you want to say space for the spirit or the, you know, whatever, but just you sort of shift a little bit, get that alignment there and make it a little deeper and wider and fuller. And it's very helpful to do that. Uh, Bob and Bridget also, you know, I think that you to make sure your mind doesn't drift to this sort of empties your mind. Yeah. Uh -huh. I can usually get beyond the point where my mind starts to, you know, do, do, do this and this. But my problem with, uh, I don't know if it's a problem it, with meditation, is the distraction of, you know, my nose itches or, you know, I, you know oh, it's, yeah. it's the physical stuff that, that really doesn't mean anything. And, and if you keep going, you can get away from that but it's hard to not you know <laughs> you know when you're you're calm and stuff and, and and your mind is is just floating and you're not really thinking of anything and you've gotten beyond the point where i have to do this and i have to pick up this and i have to you know get that kid yeah 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 but i think the distraction for me sometimes the meditation the physical you know, once my mind is calm, my body says, okay, it's my turn. <laughs> yeah. Yes, this is actually a really good point. And I have a, a really awesome friend in Boston. She she has a few of these up on, on like YouTube or Instagram. But she does a movement meditation. She'll do some sort of a flow, even if it's from a chair, right? Because not everybody 
is in a day where they can be up to date. But like anything to kind of get some of that energy out to. Yeah. Then they usually will sit like, um, you know, 45 minute periods and then you do kin hen or a walking meditation. So very contemplative, slow walking meditation yeah. to kind of do something different, you know, and then you go back and do some sitting meditation again. Yes. And some movement. Yes, which is another, um, you know, I was on a silent retreat once, so you can walk slowly in a like 10 foot, I would not do that in heels, my God, <laughs> that's a horrible idea, but to really like, yeah. and yeah, notice yeah. things, <laughs> uh, and to do it outside is really fun too, but I, it, which is how I discovered when it's really cold, let me know if you already know this, and I just discovered it at like a 44 year old kind of moment, but <laughs> The bees were under the flowers. It was a kind of cold day. And you know, you're like, where do the bees go when it's, they were all hovered under the flower, which I only knew because I was walking that slow. So, but yeah, you could walk around your bedroom, your, your living room, it just, so there are different things you can do if, because sometimes sitting is not good today for whatever reason, we're too anxious, whatever. And so there are moments where today is not a good day to sit. Today is a good day to walk or move or sing, but not just breathe. If our breath cannot be still. One of the obstacles I have is that I always feel like I'm not doing it very well. You know, so I'm not making progress and da, 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 and I'm the absent, the complete opposite of contemplative stillness. How do you disable that voice of perfection I think for me and I'm sure there's like a technical answer to be offered but for me um, doing it more helped me stop asking that question because I when I first started I was always like I don't know I didn't grow up in this so I don't know if this is right or wrong uh, and then no one's really telling you if it's right or wrong and then this all belongs right <laughs> So for one thing, just continuing helps me to stop monkey minding about am I doing it right? And then also I was really big into creating a scenario where everybody could play, everybody could be a part. So where as like there are some meditation people who would say if you feel uh, an itch on your face, don't itch it and notice how it'll fade away. Could it just make you want to itch talking about it? You just created the itch. Oh. <laughs> wait, wait till I say headlines, right? Like, <laughs> um, I would itch. I would just go ahead and itch. And um, sometimes I am really busy. Like I, I come to prayer times in the middle of work days sometimes. And I am thinking about what I was just doing and thinking about what's coming next. And so there is a thing called statio which is a really cute word, S-T-A-T-I-O, which literally means to pause, to just take a moment, let this thing that happened before stop, and let this thing that's happening now begin, so that we don't just go from one thing to the next. We always do that, right? We go from one thing to the next. Um, so this can help too. Oh, my brain is asking if I'm doing it right again. Pause. Mm -hmm. We were talking today in the service, right, about renew, to, to go again, to reset, try again, just restart. And I think um, Cynthia Borgal, she works at uh, Richard Rohr, the Center for Contemplation and Action. She has a great 15 minute video on YouTube. And this one woman she tells a story about was doing this for the first time. And she came and she said, oh, I lost track like, 15,000 times in the last 10 minutes. And um, the woman said back to her, how excellent, 15,000 opportunities to return to God. <laughs> 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 Which is a really helpful. Maybe that was the exaggeration. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite good. Right? Yeah, yeah because it's, I think eventually, Somebody convinced me. I think it, I originally thought I have to stop having these distractions because that's how I become good at this. 
And eventually someone actually convinced me, you don't ever stop having that experience of, oh, I was thinking, and then I, I'm returning again. I was thinking, I'm returning again. That will happen, like maybe less on some days because you don't have as much to think about or something, but it's going to keep happening. So how excellent. Do you ever do like counting your breath is sometimes a good kind of a training wheels type of thing because you can count from one to 10 and then you just keep going back one through 10. Then you find yourself thinking and then like, oh, oh okay, let's just come back and, and drop the judgment. You know, you don't have to judge it. Just like, okay, good. I was thinking again. Now I'll come back one through 10. And it's kind of helps you refocus. I totally need the training. Yeah, so it's good training. I mean, I'm still doing it. I, I, I do that frequently. So good. It's a good way to start, you know? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, there's multiples. So you could count your breaths until you're like, oop, and then start back. There's box breathing. So inhale for four, hold for four, exhale for four, et cetera. I feel like that's a triangle. Someone else probably holds again. <laughs> I have, um, I, because of my, my singing career, I like to inhale for four, exhale for six. And I don't hold in the middle because it gets me crazy inside. So. <laughs> <laughs> You have to figure out what works for you is the thing, but but Josette likes box breathing, right? I love box breathing, yeah. but there's multiple variations. Like again, I think I, I it also makes me crazy to hold it. I'm like, well, this is the opposite of contemplative. <laughs> so I just inhale for four, exhale for eight, and then inhale for four, exhale for eight. Yeah, rectangle breathing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Rectangles. <laughs> That's good. With my ADHD brain, I, for a long time, <coughs> kind of was like, oh, I have not think this, but I think this, and I've gotten to the point of, um, like, I can't come up with word, but like, accepting, like, okay, this thought entered my mind, or this sound, or whatever, I see you, I hear you, bye-bye, and then, or, or see it through, and, you know, like, in the exercise here today, there were multiple things that entered my head of like, oh, what are we going to do about whatever? But I kind of like solved it and then stopped and then like returned to your speaking or the sound as opposed to if I'm just driving my car, it's going to go on to the next thought. <laughs> like it, somehow it was like more like, okay, I got a solution. And so maybe that's the purpose of that instead of saying, oh, this didn't work for me because I couldn't stay focused on my breathing. Well, no, it worked for me because I was able to detach from enough other things that things that were heavy on my mind, I could take care of. And like, so finding solutions and not treating them as problems, if yeah. that makes sense. That does make sense. Yeah. I like to try to think of it as mind and the brain being two different things. The brain controls your body and your system automatically. And this is what you've been used to doing and your brain just operates that way. But you have the mind, which can tell your brain, yeah, those thoughts are all there, but now I'm controlling you for a few minutes and we're stopping that. Mm -hmm. So it's just a subtle difference between mind and brain, what you control or what your body naturally wants to control. It's the same with when you want to move or scratch your nose, your brain is fighting your mind. Your brain is saying, I don't want to do this. I want to go and do my old habits or ways. But your mind can say, great, you're there, you're working, that's good. But now I'm in control for five minutes, 10 minutes. Yes, yeah. I, I guess the other thing that I, I think is probably helpful is if you work on the meditation and you find that your mind is racing and doing too many of those things, it's sort of like, this was a chance for you to look at your instrument cluster. You come out of that and you realize you're kind of overdriving the machine and maybe you should work on that outside of meditation to simplify that. So next time you get there, your instrument panel is all kind of where it needs to be. The RPMs that have slowed down or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So nothing lost. In other words, there's no way to fail at it. Because you've just gone to, you're checking your instrument panel and 
Maybe you get it right at that point. And maybe I you always don't. overdrive the machine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know any other way of driving than to overdrive. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I practice this all like so even now we're in this group and and everyone is sharing. So as people share, I look them directly in the eye and I take in that sacred breath on purpose, right? And I exhale and I stay there with that intentional grounding idea. So you can practice this like at the dinner table, right? You can practice this when you are on a Zoom call, when you're getting I don't go to McDonald's, but say you did when you're ordering food at McDonald's. We have a kid that throws up on fast food. So that stopped that in a hurry. But to just kind of be with it all the time, I took that sacred breath in. I let that sacred breath out. And then, yes, sometimes we're going to be busy. In fact, because I work at a computer a lot, and I, I use a laptop, and I work, I work all over the house, like wherever someone else isn't, right? <laughs> um, so I took, in grad school, you had to take movement as part of your training. And so we had these lovely dance teachers that would teach you know, that part. And they're amazing, and I'm just so, so. But you can be sitting in a chair and do a six-point stretch with your breathing. So. It's sort of like inhale and lift to the sky. Exhale, C curve. Twist to one side and inhale. Twist to the other side and inhale. Crunch, crunch. Stretch to one side and inhale. Stretch to the other side and inhale. So it's like a six point stretch, right? Up, C curve, twist around. Twist around, and you can do it with your breath. And it's so helpful. It's just another way to employ the breath to take a statio, right? To take that little pause to put some of these in the day. And then, you know, if you have a whole weekend, you can go play with all of this for longer. But it doesn't have to only be when we have time for a silent retreat, right? It can be throughout the day, little bits at a time, all the time. Any other comments, questions, musings? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I just want to say, if you're like trying to write notes and trying to, oh, I hope you remember where she's teaching us. We are recording this, and I can send send the link to all of you, so you can like look through the recording to find <laughs> some of the things she said and the model for us, so you don't have to worry about trying to remember. Beautiful. There are so many more fun things we could do. So if this is fun to you, tell someone you know. <laughs> yes. Um, this, the, this class, I didn't get a chance to introduce you, um, but everyone kind of knows you. <laughs> but anyway, part of our idea, and um, it was a wise idea of St. Dean's, was um, to start with this forum um, for all, so people get a taste of kind of what Christina had in mind of offering to us um, as it could be an ongoing class. So. It's, um, it, that seems like something that um, might work for you or, or serve you. Um, I think she's interested in moving forward with that. I would be interested in ongoing, even a Zoom call maybe once a week. I have belonged to a group where we had a Zoom and once a week. Um, we would sit quietly for 30 minutes. You go on Zoom and you don't talk. <laughs> but because all of us made the effort and all of us were there, it really helped to do it, to have that time, that commitment. Yeah. Yeah, I do a prayer time on Mondays at 1230 over Zoom. So anybody is welcome. That's the great thing about Zoom. And we go through different types of practices. I was doing one that was 20 minutes on Thursday nights, but literally I was by myself a lot, so I stopped. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm happy to do something beyond the Monday at 1230. We could do like a themed one, so we could do a movement or an art or music or journaling. We could, or we could do a like half day retreats. There's so many things that we could do over and over again because the the practices are unlimited. It turns out, and just when I think I have found the last thing that there is to be found, somebody shows me something else, and I'm like, you're gonna be kidding me. So. Yes, I'd be happy to do more.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Yes. It's good to have you online. What do you do with that?